Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to take you on a bit of a history and sort of an expedition into the history of computing. And at the end, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about what our children are going to be facing in the future. So to begin with, think about um, maybe starting now and then going back in time to when computing really started. Back in the 1900s, computing was actually a career. Uh, if you tabulated numbers, you were considered a computer. You added them up, and that was a pretty nice job to have. Um, there was no such thing as an electronic computer. Fast forward a little bit. I mean, go ahead to maybe the 1940s. You know, we were actually building room-sized computers, these huge boxes, to actually try to break Enigma codes, cryptographic codes, to, to win a big war, to save the world. These were big computers. They were sort of computers as calculators. You know, a big box that could tabulate numbers. And back then, you know, we might have had, uh, I don't know, four or five in the entire world. So this was sort of a, a little hill. We had a few of these uh, calculators. And that was it. They were named after the people who had the career, by the way. You know, they, they said, those people called computers, let's call these electronic computers. Now, just to give context, uh, the chairman of IBM said that he imagined that there, back in about 1946, there was probably a worldwide market for five computers. So, <laughs> um, but that highlights something interesting, which is we are really bad at predicting the future. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so, okay, let's, let's fast forward. Let's go um, to the 1970s and, and all the way up to today when we really started climbing this mountain of the computers that we recognize. You know, the, this was all based on this idea that you could look into a computer and you could actually see a place. You know, there were folders and, and a trash can. In fact, it was a whole sort of a, a desktop. And you looked inside of the computer and you saw all of your stuff. In fact, all the information was in the computer. And, and this was a, a pretty significant move. Um, this really started around the late 1960s and up to all the way to today. Um, and the fascinating thing here is now there are lots of computers. This isn't just a small hill with four or five. We now have a lot of computers. In fact, if you were to count, I think just about two or three months ago, we, we started to the very top of this mountain. We actually ended up with about a billion internet users uh, right at the beginning of this year. So this is pretty significant. We have climbed a huge mountain. We have, we have really um, reached the pinnacle. You know, this is a big deal, a, a billion internet users. So, um, but here's the thing. You know, we have a hard time thinking about the future. We have a hard time predicting the future. Most of us think we're living at the end of time. Most of us believe that tomorrow will be mostly just like today, except for like smaller cell phones uh, and flying cars. I think that's, that's what we think about the future. Um, because we don't really learn from history that much. Well, if you were to go forward in time, you'll actually find that most analysts agree that there will be something like a trillion information devices in the world, all communicating, all connecting, within the next five or ten years. This is not way out into the future. A trillion. So this is hard. This is hard for people to kind of get their head around. We heard this morning, um, anything above maybe five or ten, we just call many, you know, or maybe a hundred. Okay? So, let me give you a sense of how big this is. Uh, somebody taught me once that the best way to think about big numbers is to count back in seconds. So how big is a trillion? Let's, let's try to give everyone a sense of that. Um, let's start with um, a million, maybe. What we'll do first is let's count back in seconds, a million seconds from right now. How far back do you think that is? So it's about a week and a half. That's not too bad. You know, a million seconds is about a week and a half ago. All right, let's try a billion. How far back is a billion seconds from right now? I dressed better back then. It was about the you know, mid-1970s. So a million seconds, about a week and a half ago. A billion seconds, maybe late 1970s. All right, now you're ready. Mentally think in your head how far back a trillion seconds would be. You don't have to shout it out. I just want you to think about it. And let's go ahead and, and check it out. So give me a trillion. How far back is that? Maybe, maybe that was the 1900s or maybe 1950s. Uh, no, no, maybe the 1500s, no, no, maybe 1 AD, no, 10,000, no, 30,000 years ago, okay, actually a little more than 30,000 years ago is a trillion seconds. So this gives you a little sense. We were living in caves, we were training dogs to be our best friends because nobody else would have us. Um, so today it's, it's sort of information is in the computer, but tomorrow is actually going to be people in the information. 
We're going to be so surrounded by all this information, it's going to flow around us. We'll scoop information out of the, out of the ether. You know, so it's not going to be big calculators. It's not going to be information in the computers. This is about really computing as an ecology, when we have trillions of things all connected. And I'm not talking, by the way, about like a trillion $1 bills, like our current deficit and all those discussions, right? That's actually easy. That's, that's like a trillion things that are all the same. I'm actually talking about a trillion things that are all sending you emails, that are all sending you spam, that are all needing re to be rebooted, okay? So, so put this in context. They are generating far more than a trillion bits of information. Um, and I know some of these seem kind of silly. You know, I've got a power outlet and a, and a cola can up there, but it's going to happen. Strangely enough, we actually today make more transistors than grains of rice, and we make them cheaper. It's going to get so cheap, people are going to do this. And they'll do it for, for certain reasons and certain economic reasons. <clears throat> so a lot of the leaders that are, that are sort of standing at the pinnacle of the current mountain, they've actually seen this. They know that trillions are coming. They've, they've kind of looked out there, and they've seen it. But they've kind of confused a good view with a short distance. You know, it looks like it's so close, I can just climb over there. I'll just build a ladder. I'll, I'll build a bridge. Um, but the current ways of thinking are not going to get us there. We are not going to get to the trillion node mountain. We're not going to climb that by trying to build a rickety fire tower over to there. We have, as a society, never built anything that big before. And the, the danger, I think, is that we will end up managing all of our stuff instead of using our stuff, because we're going to constantly be rebooting things and, and all that. This is a dangerous uh, game that we're in, and I don't think many people are thinking about it. We need to help our kids climb that next mountain. We need to help them learn about how to design for trillions. This is a bigger challenge than mankind has ever faced. But the exciting thing is this is also fraught with, with challenge, but opportunity as well. So we haven't solved the problem of a trillion, you know, really. Uh, and, and a wise man once told me that if you want to solve a really hard problem, go ahead and find somebody who's already solved it, or solve something close to it, and then see what patterns they used. So it turns out that we haven't solved it, but nature has. Our own bodies are complicated information systems in their own right. We have over a trillion cells, many more than a trillion cells in our body. So think about that for a second. What are the patterns that nature uses to actually deal with this complexity? So if you think about a, a person's body, and you were to kind of peel back the layers, you'd actually find that inside of the body, you know, there were things like atoms, and those atoms made up molecules, and the molecules made up cells, you know, and then those cells kind of got together and made up organs, and those organs made up systems, and then those systems made up me, and then maybe if you and I were together, that would make up us, and then if we got together with a whole bunch of other people, we would form communities. That's a phenomenon called layered complexity. Use the simplest thing to do, to do the complex task or the simple task, just as much as you need. Don't use the most complex thing to do your simple task. Right now, we're practically throwing Linux computers and PCs, the pinnacle of mankind, at every problem. And that's just not sustainable. Nature also uses some other things. Peer-to-peer, -peer, survival of the fittest, mostly hierarchical composition. These are patterns that you can discover in nature, and we need to actually learn about how this stuff works if we're going to tackle the future. <clears throat> I think trillions are the future. And that's what's going to happen. It's sort of the natural inertia of the system. We're moving in that direction. And, and you might be saying to yourself, well, do I even want to climb that mountain? You know, and, and if you think about it, if you were to go into the future and look, there would probably be some big challenges there. You know, if you think about it, um, you know, I have a shoebox at home where it has all my pictures, and my family did as well. But there's a whole generation today that has no shoeboxes that store all their pictures. They actually upload their pictures straight to Flickr or Picasso or to YouTube and their videos. They've never actually had them printed out somewhere. <clears throat> Last week, or two weeks ago, Microsoft sent out a note to all of their owners of Sidekicks, little cell phones, that said, we're sorry, we just lost all your pictures, all your calendars, all your contact information, all your notes from your cell phones. Here's a $100 gift certificate. <laughs> so think about this. There are some big challenges if we don't think about how we actually scale to this size. And if we continue to do what we're doing, we might face those. We might have a generation of kids who don't have pictures of their family, and we'll call it the shoebox dark age, because it just, got dis it just disappeared one day from a virus. That wouldn't happen in nature, by the way. Every cell has a DNA molecule, and every cell can replicate. <clears throat> so there are also some positive things that could happen. Imagine if um, we just uh, put on the internet a whole bunch of the outlets, the light switches, and the sockets that are around our world. So there are estimated to be about 300 billion of those. If we could actually just 
take a, a small percentage, analysts say that we could reduce our energy consumption by between 40 and 60 percent if we just had them on the net and we could actually manage them and if we could kind of use those to actually learn from those things. And think about our kids. It's possible that we'll just discover you know, the, uh, the instruction manual for the human body. We have all these separate pieces of information and we don't know how they connect. But if we did, maybe cancer would just pop out one day and we'd be able to solve it. We'd understand how it works and it would, it would come out. And, and this is not you know, starry-eyed. This is stuff that's happening. We've already seen what can happen when you start connecting computers up and you start looking at people's brains. There are just amazing things that could happen. And what I'd like to do is, is look at a future where our kids are actually able to use the world and use the technology to do something amazing, not spend all their time fixing things and calling the geek squad. So I'll leave you with a quote. Uh, Alan, Alan Kay was actually one of the inventors of our current mountain. He was one of the guys who worked back at a place called Xerox Park in the 1970s and invented this idea of a mouse and a desktop. And you look inside and you see you know, folders and, and things like that. And he said, any medium powerful enough to extend man's reach is powerful enough to topple his world. To get the medium's magic to work for one's aims rather than against them is to attain literacy. And my hope for the kids coming out today is they not only become literate, but they become fluent in the future that they're going to be living in. Thank you very much.